Hello, and welcome to the AIM2 broadcast this Wednesday uh, in the middle of July. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the viewers and uh, to this broadcast here, but most especially, I'd like to welcome Martin Manzer, uh, who is joining us all the way from Tipperary uh, this evening. How are you doing, Martin? Well, I'm in Dublin. I'm actually in Dublin uh, this evening. Very good. Well, listen, thanks a million for joining us. I do appreciate it. And just many of you will obviously know Martin uh, already, but for many who don't know uh, Martin, Martin uh, was a Fianna Fáil TD. Uh, he was a Fianna Fáil uh, senator. And um, Martin uh, worked as a minister, I believe, in the Department of Finance, a junior minister in the Department of Finance and a junior minister for the arts as well between 2008 and 2011. But many people will, will know Martin played a, a very large and important and influential role in the development of the peace process in the north of Ireland uh, and in the Good Friday Agreement uh, as well. And uh, since then, Martin has uh, operated as a newspaper columnist uh, in both the Irish Times and the Irish Catholic too. So I am deeply grateful to you, Martin, uh, for joining us in this de debate tonight. And I look forward to getting stuck into a good discussion about the topic of you know, how to achieve Irish unity and obviously an objective of so many people and for so many years uh, as well. Before we start that, I usually give a rundown uh, with regards to the political shenanigans uh, and situations that are happening uh, in Ireland at the moment, north and south. And people will know there's lots of shenanigans happening at the moment. Uh, the doll is full of drama and it often amazes me in a way uh, because Obviously, we, we have a situation where a former minister, uh, Barry Cowan, was involved in a drink driving situation a number of years ago. And as a result of that and the information that came out, has lost his job and uh, he has been fired. Probably the fastest firing, I think, of a minister in the history uh, of the state. And it shows, I suppose, the uneasy grounds that this government uh, is, is on, even in its first few weeks. But it shocks me because the political establishment in this country love nothing more than a minister being fired. Uh, the media and the political bubble all focus in on these types of issues. But we were going to have an investigation in how the details of his case was leaked to a newspaper. But it just strikes me that, you know, we had a thousand people die in nursing homes throughout the country. Um, the most uh, exposed and the most vulnerable of people uh, lost their lives you know, in a very, very tragic circumstances. And yet we have no investigation with regards to what's happened to those people uh, as of yet. Sometimes our priorities in the political system can get skewed, uh, unfortunately. AIM2 also broke last week um, the fact that the childcare sector is under fierce pressure. So hundreds of childcare operators may not open in, in September, which will leave many papers in fierce trouble. And you can tell a country uh, and the value of a country by how it treats its most vulnerable. And in many ways, the youngest and the oldest are the most vulnerable we have in society. And yet, it's those two sectors which are under uh, the most pressure uh, currently. Another interesting uh, point during the week was there's a spike of former members and supporters of the SDLP uh, contacting AIM2 currently uh, across uh, the north of Ireland. Many of them looking to join uh, the political party, uh, many looking to get involved especially with the radical change in direction of the leadership of that party uh, on the human right to life just uh, in recent times as well. Uh, we have today the, the incredible news that uh, the Apple tax case in which Apple had not paid its full tax to the people of the state, the European Commission said so, and then we had the Irish government spent about nearly 10 million euros on solicitors fighting that case. Um, now, I would believe that tax justice is very, very important. We have a situation right now where the richest 1% of the planet own twice the amount of wealth than 6.9 billion people. That's worth saying again. The richest 1% of the planet own twice the amount of wealth than, than the rest, the 6.9 billion people living uh, on this particular planet. Never before in the history of the planet was there such a chasm between rich and poor. And that chasm is getting deeper and wider as the generations go by. And tax justice is a serious element 
uh, with regards trying to even out that plane. Uh, and tax justice is about big corporations that make massive profits paying their fair share of tax. And we believe that that should happen. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to go on to the, the main element of uh, this particular uh, broadcast tonight, and that's the issue of how to achieve uh, Irish unity. So, obviously, the unity of the Irish people, North and South, is one of the main pillars of uh, our new political party, and we will be bringing guests from other political parties um, to these particular debates to discuss how we can go about that. And just to give you a little bit of perspective on it from our perspective, um, but three years ago, Martin, I did a, uh, a study <clears throat> in Leinster House as part of the Committee on Enterprise into the All-Ireland Economy. And I had the opportunity to uh, interview about 100 people uh, in the north of Ireland from all different backgrounds and from both sides of the community. And these people were like educationalists, farmers, trade unionists, business people, um, you know, people with, within the health services, uh, etc. And all of them, you know, without... Uh, you know, a, a, any a, a person outside of that example said that if we plan together as an island, if we fund services together, and if we deliver services together, they are more likely to be better services, uh, and they're more likely to be more efficient uh, and help people uh, more productively. And that struck me. That was the first investigation on the All Ireland Economy that was undertaken in Leinster House since the partition of the state, believe it or not. And everybody from all the different backgrounds, just on a cooperation basis on the idea of, of services and need, were of the view that further integration was just a good idea. The second issue would be uh, on an economics basis, obviously, uh, we believe that it's, it's positive. Self-determination is a good thing. We believe that decisions made closer to the people that they affect are better decisions because you can influence those decisions. And you can also hold the decision makers to account. So we believe you can't really hold people in London to account, definitely not in Berlin or, or Brussels either. And also there's a, there's a I think, a, a justice element to Irish unity. There's a natural justice, you know, where whereby the Irish people have long sought, you know, to unite orange and green together uh, for our better uh, opportunity in future. So the first probably question that I, I'll ask yourself, Martin, if I can, is first of all, you're part, very much part of the, the Good Friday Agreement process and the peace process. If you had a glimpse of 2020, as it is now, north-south and the relationships that exist in the island, then would you feel happy? Would you feel that you, you had achieved what you and your 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 fellow party members had set out then. Uh, yes, but I, I'd also mention, of course, uh, the the big civil service team who were very involved in the peace process. But yes, I would be broadly um, happy uh, with progress made. I mean, obviously, there are lots more things to be done. It isn't perfect. There have been quite uh, long interruptions, both in the early 2000s and then over the last three years. But, I mean, compare it. I mean, the Treaty of Versailles, 20 years afterwards, you, we were into the Second World War. I mean, the Good Friday Agreement is still relevant. It is still being talked about. It is still the basic framework for what we're doing. So, yes, uh, broadly speaking, um, I'd be pleased. Now, obviously... Uh, I would regard the Brexit process as a setback mm. and the immediate challenge uh, is uh, to protect the gains of the Good Friday Agreement in a Brexit context. Do you think that the Brexit context materially affects the Good Friday Agreement uh, or is it just that it affects the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement? Well, clearly it affects the spirit. I'm not sure about uh, about the letter. I mean, it didn't enter into anybody's heads, I don't think, either British or Irish, let alone any of the parties, that Britain and Ireland wouldn't still be partners in the EU, uh, more or less into the indefinite future, as long as the EU itself um, existed. So, in a sense, 
and then many of the parts of the Good Friday Agreement, I mean, are predicated on the assumption uh, that both um, countries um, are parts of the EU. Um, so, I, I mean, it's it's a disappointment that's happened. However, it has changed the question of Irish unity to a degree because um, there's now, for any voter in the Northern Ireland, uh, uh, there's the added question is, well, do we want to go back to being fully fully part of the EU and members of the EU? Now, I know that de facto, to a considerable extent, uh, they will be under the, under, yeah. under the arrangements, but that's not quite the same thing, say, particularly things like the common agricultural policy and so on. That's not quite the same thing as being actually a full integral part of it. Yeah. But can I, can I say that, um, for example, the Good Friday Agreement placed a lot of weight on what was called the consent of the people of the North of Ireland. So in other words, the North of Ireland could dictate or direct by majority. Consent of both um, which, parts of Ireland. Consent of both parts of Ireland. It's the consent yeah, of both was, parts of Ireland. It does. And, but I'm, I'm saying this in specific to the Brexit issue, because yes. in many ways, the, the, the people of the North of Ireland voted against Brexit. And so there was a majority yes. of the people of the North who voted against Brexit. And that self-determination made by the people democratically uh, was taken by the Tory government and scrunched into a little ball and thrown into a waste paper bin and completely ignored. And in but many ways, it's that uh, ability of London to constantly ignore the actual democratic wishes of either part of Ireland that have, you know, s damaged relationships so much between Ireland and Britain over the last couple of hundred well, years. Well, I mean, the, the United Kingdom is in reality an English hegemony. About 84% of the population is English. Um, mm. And so unless English opinion is very evenly divided, then the people of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are not going to have a real say. I mean, it is very far from being a federal state. In a federal state, um, these, sort of, uh, these sort of decisions, uh, you know, there would be more consultation, um, uh, more, 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 more consensus. But, I mean, that's the reality of the United Kingdom. And there's another point to that, and I think I think it's spot on there, because um, if you look at the way Britain has organized itself historically, the home counties, let's say that kind of section around London, um, it gets most of the focus, most of the investment, most of the uh, economic activity, uh, most of the energy that's generated by the British state is is concentrated in that space. So even Scotland, even Wales, even the north of England, gets a really bad deal to a certain extent how Britain is built. Yeah, well, you see, at the time of the Act of Union in, in 1800, the English complacently presented it, well, you know, it's really like, like a marriage. But as the Irish writer Maria Edgeworth noted, uh, in those days, marriage was totally unequal. The, the, <laughs> the wife was simply <laughs> the chattel of the husband, so it wasn't very reassuring. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a funny thing, because if you, if you look at Ireland at the time of the partition, the three or four counties around Belfast were by far the richest counties in the country. Mm. The most economic, economic activity occurred in, in, in that part of Ireland. All of the industry, all of the manufacturing, like this, the South only was known for manufacturing biscuits and beer uh, outside of the agricultural elements uh, of it. So what happened since partition is... I believe, uh, and I think that the facts stand for this, is the focus has gone on London and the home counties economically. And as a result, the North has rapidly declined economically vis-a-vis -vis or in comparison to the southern state, where right now probably incomes in the southern state are twice probably the amount uh, that exists in the North. So people sometimes say, well, Patter, you know, we, we, we can't afford Irish unity. But in, in the truth of the matter is self-determination is actually a key element of economic development. And it's that absence of self-determination in the North that's actually impoverished the Northern economy in a significant fashion. That the people of, 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 of Newry are just as enterprising as the people of Dundalk. The people of Derry are just as bright as the people of, of Letterkenny. You know, the people of Dungannon are you know, just as hungry to work as the people of Monaghan Town. But because decisions are not made in the interests of the people of the North of Ireland, typically, when the economy is, is, is uh, uh, worked out in Britain, uh, the North has suffered significantly. 
I, I think there is a the problem is a kind of a historically based lack of self confidence among the unionist Protestant population. Now, my grandparents would have been unionist in the south of Ireland, um, and we just had to get on with it after the 1920s and uh, you know most people did I mean all right there were difficulties around the time of the war of independence civil war to a certain extent but I mean afterwards um, uh, things settled down and uh, uh, you know there aren't too many people uh, perhaps outside the three southern Ulster counties where there's a certain sort of urban a shift perhaps in the in the in the Belfast direction uh, to some degree, uh, but I mean outside of that, I mean uh, there isn't much emigration of mm. the um, uh, southern Protestant population um, uh, to Northern Ireland, and indeed uh, there never was. Yeah. No, it's interesting because as a party, we are obviously functioning on both sides of the border, and you know people from a Protestant background or a Unionist background have come to our meetings, and many of them have joined us actually, and but they would indicate that. A number of things have really destabilized their faith in the union. Uh, one of those is Brexit, for a start, and the lack of interest of London in the democratic decision of the North. Uh, the second one actually would have been the right to life issue. Uh, many people uh, from a unionist background were just really frustrated that Westminster imposed a law so draconian on the North of Ireland uh, against the wishes of the people of the North. The third issue is the recent issue of COVID-19, in that um, people would, would see that the the island of Ireland is an epidemiological unit and, you know, the, the, the virus doesn't uh, uh, respect any border. And if we're going to fight COVID-19, logic would dictate that we do it together and make decisions as, as such. Can I ask you a question? Just um, I, I had a brief conversation with you earlier on this. Do you believe that the Good Friday Agreement is a rigid stationary document? Or no. do you believe that it's a moving document that can help with the evolution of the island? Well, I think it was always a framework document. And you can look at specific things where a lot of flesh had to be put on on it in terms of subsequent agreements you know the north south institutions weren't actually specified uh, you know what the areas they were going to cover in the good friday agreement um the decommissioning section uh, was very aspirational there were principles for police reform but that had to be properly fleshed out in the pattern report and so on so i mean i think it's a document uh, that i mean like constitutions uh, that should evolve with time and be quite open to uh, sort of subsequent add-on agreements that are done with consensus. I mean, I wouldn't be going backwards. I wouldn't be scrapping it or anything like that. I think the basic principles uh, are there and, uh, and they're fundamental to the underpinning of peace as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I would be slow to change it fundamentally, but in a forward direction, uh, there's no reason why it can't be, um, uh, you know, added to and um, more specifics um, put into to the extent that they're properly agreed. So, in other words, the ambition of or the, the, the rate of change in the Good Friday Agreement is probably based on the ambition of the government's north and south. So, if you had an administration in the north and the south who simply wanted to deepen the level of integration as, you know, to maybe to co cooperate more with regards um, infrastructural planning. Like, for example, AIM2 would be of the view that we should be spatially planning as one island. The idea that there's two spatial plans operating back to back with each other is just so illogical, it doesn't make sense. You know, that we, we, we would be, let's say, surfacing roads up to the border, and then on the other side of the border, they, they wouldn't have the same level of surface. That you would have maybe, you know, a, that you would have a an air helicopter, an air ambulance helicopter operating in and it's skilling and maybe covering the six counties that that should logically cover also uh, Donegal and Sligo and Leitrim and Monaghan and Cavan, you know, so that there is so much room just for really basic, logical, clever uh, integration. And many much of that isn't really happening at the moment. Yeah, no, I agree totally. And of course, 
we shouldn't forget that that Ulster is actually nine counties, not six counties, mm -hmm. and for certain purposes that you're talking about, no, I think it, it, it is happening in health, it's happening in energy, to a certain extent in transport, but obviously there's a lot more, uh, more scope, and probably outside of sort of food and agriculture, um, you know, north-south uh, economic interaction is more underpowered than sort of overpowered. But I mean, what, what is going to be interesting is, I mean, the North, if it plays its cards right, I mean, it has economic opportunities in being, if you like, both part of the UK market and the European single market at any rate de facto. And um, I've long felt, I mean, this goes back to Albert Reynolds's day, um, that, for example, to have a common corporation tax, uh, common, I mean, we promote tourism internationally is, is promoted uh, by Tourism Ireland. And I mean, similarly, um, inward investment could be, but you would have to align, uh, um, you know, the tax conditions and other things to do. It. And in principle, um, uh, you know, the British, perhaps a bit surprisingly, the Treasury did agree that even in, 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 in Owen Patterson's time, but it has never actually been implemented. And, yeah. uh, and so this, this, I this think there are opportunities. Mm. Mm. Yes, sir, Sorry. this is a key issue because if you look at Invest NI and Intertrade Ireland and the IDA have offices in all of the main cities internationally. And they're competing with each other for foreign direct investments uh, into into Ireland's north and south. It, there it, is tourism. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland isn't What's really that? properly benefiting um, uh, from that yeah. because it's operating on on on, on a smaller scale. And uh, I mean, uh, it, uh, tourism Ireland has operated fairly as between the two jurisdictions, and I have no doubt, and I think the whole would be greater than the parts. I certainly remember at the time of the peace process in, in New York and other places in the United States, there was a great deal of keenness to, to start treating the whole of Ireland as a single market, as a single economic unit, ideally a united Ireland, but that might come down the road. Um, so uh, the opportunities, I think, are still there. The opportunities are there, but I will say in my analysis that there actually was, was great movement in around 1998. Steps were Significant steps were taken around the energy markets, around Intertrade Ireland and, and around, let's say, Tourism Ireland, et cetera. But there has been precious little development in truth, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. since about the year 2000, 2003 till now. So we've gone about 17 years with very little development uh, in any north-south integration. I want to just move on to the next section, if I can. Now, the next, there has been great movement uh, in views and opinion uh, in the north of Ireland in recent times and in the south of Ireland. And there's no doubt in the south of Ireland, the vast majority of people support Irish unity. Um, the time scale of that might be slightly in question, but there is a majority in the south that support Irish unity. Uh, in the north of Ireland, the demographics are obviously changing in the north, but there's also been a, a shift opinion-wise. So depending on which opinion poll you look at, support for Irish unity is around maybe between 35% and maybe about 45%, and depending on the poll. But significantly, if you look at the election polls, the unionist bloc, election-wise, no longer holds a majority. So in the last... Stormont elections and in the last Westminster elections, these were the first elections in that statelet ever which the, the unionists failed to win a majority. Now, some of that vote went to a maybe a non-aligned group of, of voters in, in the Alliance and in the Greens uh, constitutionally, etc. But it's true that we're, we're at a verge, I believe, or at least an opportunity uh, with regards uh, Irish unity. Now, obviously, we want it to happen it to happen in a peaceful fashion. We want it to happen in a spirit of partnership, um, and we want to to convince and persuade as many people as we can from the different communities that this is good for all of us. Um, but obviously, a decision like this, in my view, needs a certain level of preparation because if you jump into a um, a referendum situation very very quickly without any preparation, you know you're not going to be sure of the results. Uh, or the outcome after that. 
So what we've suggested is that there should be a new Ireland forum. And that forum would bring together all of civic society and political society north and south. Now, absolutely, maybe some, a minority of, of, the, of the political view in the north might be represented of that at first. But at least we should be in an island situation thinking about how we can organize this country, how we can maybe further integrate health services, etc. How we can fight against the worst excesses of Brexit together in a, in a in, a, in a, at least in a discussion, and I think that type of discussion, that New Ireland Forum situation, could be beneficial to planning for potentially a, 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 a an independence poll in the future. Yeah, well, I, I have had experience uh, in the background, the New Ireland Forum, uh, which was very useful in its day, and also the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation, which. Um, uh, came into being about two months after the good uh, after the um, IRA ceasefire, and it was indeed part of the sort of terms and conditions under which the ceasefire was going to take place. And there's no doubt they both did useful work. Um, and the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation had a larger membership. People like the Alliance Party, the Greens, the Workers mm -hmm. Party. Senator Gordon Wilson and so on um, uh, uh, were members and you know in both cases there were individual unionists or members of the unionist community who came and gave evidence um, There was some northern representation also at the Forum for Europe subsequently. Um, so, I mean, I mean those, those bodies um, can do use, useful tasks. I think a lot of um, academic or quasi-academic institutions, including one that I'm a member of, Royal Irish Academy, Academy, will be looking at issues that sort of relate as to how um, the two parts of Ireland would, would, would come together. And as you know, there's now the shared um, island uh, unit. Um, I suppose 20 years ago that would have been called an agreed island, but you know, yeah. they mean the same thing. Um, I, yeah. I think there's, there's, there's lots of benefit in teasing those things out. What, what I just wouldn't want is um, uh, you know, people to be put up against a wall, driven into their trenches and said, look, now you must have a united island, um, um, mm. uh, more or less uh, straight away. Indeed, I wouldn't be in favour of holding a poll until there's at least a reasonable chance um, of a successful conclusion. But can I just give you an analogy? Um, the, the divorce referendums. In 1986, the then government put forward a divorce referendum and they hadn't worked out in any detail what that was going to involve and therefore couldn't answer the basic questions of what will happen if. Um, it was defeated two, two to one. And then over the next 10 years, very detailed legislation, particularly Alan Shatter's separation bill came in. All the details were worked out. And then it only just passed 50% plus one. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 it's an illustration of the fact that, um, uh, you see, I don't think if, even if, say, people in the Republic are, are broadly uh, supportive um, of a united Ireland, uh, it can't be entirely divorced from terms and conditions. I mean, it does depend on oh, what it involves. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And, and to be honest, and that's one of the reasons why we have been pushing with such, I suppose, vigour around this idea of, of an All Ireland Forum, whereby you know, we, we sit down and start that discussion, start that planning, start scoping out all the different elements of it. You mentioned the Shared Ireland uh, uh, unit, which is in a, the department of the Taoiseach, the new Taoiseach. I had a debate with the new Taoiseach, uh, Michal Martin, there, well, that, I think that's... last week, uh, on the issue of it. And, um, you know, the, the, the key elements that we were focusing on was that the Good Friday Agreement states, and I'm paraphrasing, is here that obviously the union between the north of Ireland and Britain remains until the democratic will changes towards the unity of the north and the south. So it predicates the unity or the union on a majority. And so it means that Catholics and nationalists maybe have to respect that majority vote and have to have patience until they can persuade or change people, which, you know, 
is is fair enough. The problem I have is when I put it to the likes of Michal Martin, um, Michal Martin actually says, no, he does not support a, a, a United Ireland or a poll to be taken if it's just a, a simple majority. There's nearly a, a, a changing of the goalposts creeping into the system, whereby people are saying, yes, you have to have the majority of the people in the north, but you also have to have a majority of unionists who uh, agree with Irish unity to, to make it happen. So nearly there's a double lock for the will of nationalists to be achieved, but only a single lock for the will of unionists to be achieved. And that's, for me, a resiling from the Good Friday Agreement. That's a, a well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, um, uh, you know, exactly whether you're, you're, you're correctly interpreting me or Martin. Let's leave that, that issue aside. Um, but uh, I, I, I do think that you can't easily uh, change the ground rules, which are the base of the peace process but you see there is a clause uh, which is to do with the uh, the calling of a border poll uh, which uh, says that the secretary of state shall shall do this at any time if at any time it appears likely to him that a majority of those voting would express a wish that northern ireland should cease to be a part of the UK and form part of a united Ireland. Now, he isn't going to form that opinion if a opinion in the North is e absolutely evenly divided, 50% plus one. How could he possibly um, uh, come to a definite conclusion that the, there's, a, there's a wish for a change? So I think there is a certain built-in safeguard there is that, I mean, it, it, it has at least prima facie um, uh, to be a, a distinct majority. But I think, you know, the way people have thought, you know, going back to the 1970s, Garrett Fitzgerald and so yeah. on, is that a majority for a united Ireland would presumably include uh, most or practically all people from um, a nationalist background um, and a... Uh, a minority of people, um, but a, a significant minority of people uh, from a unionist background. And of course, with the developments, the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of people are not um, so strong on their religious identity uh, or background mm -hmm. any, any, any more, there is, there is a more fluid um, uh, mid, 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 middle middle ground um, uh, to be to be worked on, but I, I think you know the constitutional settlement um, in the Good Friday Agreement stands. I certainly don't agree with, say, the late Seamus Mann, for whom I had enormous respect, but I don't agree with his suggestion in his memoir that was published in the last year of his life is that you need a majority of both uh, unionists and nationalists. But I think, uh, you, you know, the idea that a, you, you, it, it, it shouldn't be, I mean, I remember somebody who was reputed, and I'm not talking about either Adams or McGuinness, who was reputed at one time to have been a member of the uh, Army Council of the IRA saying to me, 50% uh, plus one equals civil war. Uh, and that was in the early stages of the peace process. Um, so I, 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 I would be somewhere between the two positions. Is I do yeah. think you need to have, um, if possible, a reasonably clear majority. But I think uh, I wouldn't be changing the goalpost. You see, there is the other practical consideration. Let's suppose that, say, 60% of people in Northern Ireland um, want... Uh, to join with and become part of a united mm -hmm. Ireland as part of the EU. Who, who is actually going to be in a position to stop them? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the British are not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean... I mean, even even at the time of the treaty negotiations, and this was maybe a missed, a missed trick, uh, Lloyd George said, um, uh, nobody's going to fight uh, to keep Fermanagh and Tyrone. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's it does strike me um, that there are great movements uh, in opinion at the moment on a range of different issues. There's no doubt, but currently there's no doubt that there's a great movement on opinion uh, with regards Irish unity. I do believe um, people in my own party will be fed up listening to me. I do believe that 
much of people's opinions are about bread and butter issues. So mm. people instinctively want to know they have access to healthcare. They instinctively want to know that they can get housing for themselves, that they can get their kids to school and um, that they can feed their families. So, you know, I think that a job of work that has to be done is to look at how best we can achieve those hierarchy of human needs through Irish Unity, first of all, and make sure that people on both sides of the equation know that they can be answered uh, and they can be answered better with regards to uh, independence. Um, but I do believe that independence is a really important ingredient in actually achieving those things. Going back to what I said earlier, when rule happens in London, they pay, the North doesn't get the attention uh, that it deserves. It doesn't get the economic focus that it deserves. And actually, to, to tell you the truth, you know, many of the regions of the South of Ireland would feel similar because Dublin's where the decisions are making and it feels like Dublin is a place where the energy is going economically to. So um, I, I believe that there is an economic benefit for the people of the North, Catholic and Protestant, um, in the United Ireland. I believe that services would be delivered far more efficiently, far more successfully, uh, bringing greater benefits to people uh, in both communities on an All-Ireland uh, basis. We would have a stronger voice uh, in the European Union, for example, uh, with, a, with a larger uh, population. Uh, Kurt Hubner from the British Columbia University carried out an eco economic modelling, uh, similar to the, an economic model that was used for German reunification and to project for Korean uh, unification. And that modelling actually said that if both economies united, that's there would be an increase in the level of GDP by tens of billions of euros in the space between five, six and seven and eight years. But I think critically is we are probably in a unique space in the history of Ireland for the last number of hundreds of years, that that particular objective is actually within touching distance. To achieve it, I believe you do need ambition. You need, going back to what you're saying about the Good Friday Agreement, you know, for that mobile um, agreement to go in the right direction, you need administrations who will push it. Uh, I'm not sure if we have that as of yet. I know that our political party anyways is going to be at the fore to try, can we achieve um, that historical opportunity that exists now? Well, your exchange with Miho Martin, I mean, fingered one of the big issues, which was to do with, you have the National Health Service to which even Sinn Féin in the north is attached and you've a different type of health service here. Mm -hmm. um, would you marry them together? Would you let them operate a sort of separately in a sort of autonomous fashion? I mean, that is certainly something that requires a, a, a study and it's not just academic solutions. As we know, uh, there are, especially in this jurisdiction, there are very powerful vested interests. <laughs> For sure, absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, time has got the better of us. We've gone over time a good a good deal, but um, we've we've. If I had another hour or two, we I could easily uh, keep going. But I just want to thank you very much, Martin, uh, for joining us. And we keep reading uh, your articles. Keep up the good work, and we might have you back on this channel in the near future. Please, God. Yeah, yeah. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.